evening, everyone. Uh, so I would like to also thank the Orange uh, Society for giving me this opportunity and to George for uh, a couple of things. Um, I want to give a very quick background on how I got here. Um, I think you mentioned it. I've been doing archive work for Bell Laboratories for close to 30 years now. And one of the few places that I haven't been able to get into was the West Street building. And I refer to it as West Street and will through this presentation, by the way. I know it's West Beth now, but <laughs> to us at Bell Laboratories, it's always going to be West Street. Um, I've come to New York. I live in New Jersey, been in New York a million times. Uh, went past this building so many times. Actually, a few times, got out of the car, came in, was escorted back out. Uh, <laughs> I said, we used to own this building. It didn't matter. <laughs> so, uh, at one point or another, uh, over the years, we've been called by residents of the building, either uh, management committees or whatever, even artists, and they have asked for information about the building when it was Bell Labs. Uh, I think there was an anniversary 15, 20 years ago where an artist uh, used telecommunications equipment in their sculpture, which was on display here. We loan things that were invented here from our archives. Uh, but I never just never had the opportunity to get out. And uh, with the last couple of calls, I finally started to say to people, can I get in? And uh, through the help of George, uh, John Jensen and I, he's my colleague who's here, uh, finally got into the building, went through these doors, and uh, it meant a lot to us. And as we walked around and they showed us you know, what was going on here, even with the renovations, um, I started to talk about all the inventions that happened here. And George turned around and said, you know, I think the people should know that. Uh, some people do, some people don't. Would you be willing to do the talk? So that's where I am today. Little also, but another piece of information is uh, I'm, I'm introduced as an archivist instead of a historian. So with the group that I'm talking to, if you have real historians out here, archivists know a little bit about everything. The historians know a lot about it, but a few things. So, and I'm not willing, I'm very happy to be challenged on anything I present here today. Uh, this was, uh, I finished the talk last night. I really was a uh, labor of love. And if there's a few typos in there, I'll, you know, please excuse me. Uh, there's an awful lot that happened here. Uh, Bell Laboratories is world famous for very significant inventions in telecommunications and other areas that have changed the world. Uh, they're credited with research that led to eight Nobel Prizes. Um, our, our most recent one was just in 2014, so there's still a lot of activity at Bell Labs. I'm not here to talk about Bell Labs today, though. I'm here to talk about Bell Labs at West Street. And there's been, like I said, even at West Street, the list of innovations is so long that it would take much more than an hour to go over them. So I'm going to highlight the ones that I think are going to be recognizable to this audience rather than really so technical about telecommunications. Uh, and then there are some things I'm going to go through very quickly uh, because you might have already heard of them and you don't need me to beat it in force. So with that being said, let me, uh, let me get going. So Bell Laboratories was actually founded in 1925, and it was a merger of two engineering departments, of AT&T's engineering department and Western Electric. AT&T was founded in 1877 as the Bell Telephone Company. Western Electric was founded as Gray and Barton. Western Electric and AT&T became uh, together in the 1880s. AT&T providing telephone service, Western Electric manufacturing telecommunications equipment. Uh, the founders of those two companies were both researchers. They were both inventors. It was Alexander Graham Bell who invented the telephone and got the patent on the telephone. And it was Elijah Gray who invented the telephone and got to the patent office a few hours after Bell. So <laughs> Elijah Gray was a very successful inventor. He went on to invent printing telegraphs. He created this Western Electric Company. It was the best manufacturing company in the United States making telecommunications equipment. That's why AT&T eventually acquired them or a majority of their stock. And uh, they both had, from their very beginnings, research in their companies. And they called them the engineering departments, and they were there to solve problems. And uh, they continued to do that and until they finally got the idea that they should merge these two organizations together in 1925. And it was headquartered here at, at West Beth. Or West Street, sorry. <laughs> so when did we get here? Well, well, as Western Electric needed a manufacturing facility in New York, they were outgrowing smaller facilities. Uh, in 1896 is when they started to build this building. And of course, it was built in sections. In 1896, the telephone was only 20 years old. It had only been invented 20 years earlier. It was the telephone <coughs> industry was in its infancy. Uh, at that time, there were probably only 400,000 phones. 
and there was a population of 72 million people in the United States. Uh, most calls needed an operator to manually make your connection to the person you wanted to call, whether that was local or long distance. There were no dials on telephones at that time. And people could only call a distance from New York to Denver. You couldn't do transcontinental calling. Additionally, no overseas calling whatsoever. If you wanted to communicate across oceans, you sent telegraph messages through undersea telegraph cables. So there were a lot of challenges for the engineering departments to manufacture telephones, to do it in quantity that you can start to build a network, and then conquering some of the problems like just distance. So, you know, back then it was all copper cable connecting these telephones to switching offices and then across the country. And they really ran into a lot of hurdles about expanding the network and bringing telephone service to everyone. The AT&T president called it universal service, and he really meant anyone in the United States who wanted to have a telephone, we wanted to get them one of those phones. So I'm going to run through some photos to give you an idea of what it looked like in the beginning days, right through the first few years, and then I'll get to some of the innovations. So here we are in 1896. This is the factory. This is when Western Electric was doing a lot of manufacturing. This is the drafting room, 1897. Uh, Western Electric workers, 1898. They're, they're assembling telephones. These are the candlestick type telephones that you used to see, those with the handle separate from the transmitter. And I think I spelled Thayer's name wrong, but this was the Western Electric president. And this is one of the rooms I haven't seen, so maybe someday. I don't know who's got a fireplace. Does this look familiar, George? It does. Okay. So dinner there sometime. Uh, this is the engineering department. Now, this is kind of key. I like to point this out. 1913, that's the engineering department just at Westry. What was starting to happen by 1913, there was so much engineering and research required they were pushing the people out of the factories. Now, Western Electric had a major factory outside of Chicago called Hawthorne Works. There was up to 40,000 workers there at one time. We also built in Kearney, an old Ford building that we took over and expanded on. So they started to move manufacturing operations to other, to other facilities. And the engineering and research group started to take over this building. So this is up on the roof, actually, this picture was taken. Uh, this is a research laboratory, 1918. Circuit development, and again, we talk about the complicated network that's being built to connect telephones around the whole country. So you had to start to automate that. You had to look for ways to do it. They said back in the 60s or even the 40s, with the number of telephones and the operators that were required, if you didn't automate what the operators did, everyone in the company, would, in the country, would have to eventually be an operator. I don't know who you call if you're all working as an operator. Uh, chemical laboratory here at West Street. Vacuum tubes. So this is already by the 1930s. Um, this is a this was a this was a cool one. The the uh, that's a large vacuum tube. It's probably two and a half feet long right there. That was used for transatlantic radio communication. So we were building specialty type vacuum tubes. I will not go into the details on those things. I'm going to get on the more fun ones. Uh, the drafting room now by the 1940s. Look how serious it is. Uh, modifying step-by-step -step switching. Again, the, the equipment he's standing in front of does automatic dialing or, or switching of phone calls when you dial a phone. It used to go to this type of equipment and connect to the person you were trying to reach to. You should be eliminating the operator interface. So this is a mechanical switch though? This is all electromechanical at this point. Now, this was, and these have been around for many years. By 1959, that was actually outdated. Uh, telephone and telegraph. So one of the last pictures I could find of Bell Labs workers in 1966 before we vacated West Street and, and most of them moved to uh, Murray Hill, New Jersey. So that gives you an idea of the, the time that we were here. As I said, there was a progression from manufacturing to more research and when they formally created Bell Labs in 1925, there was really no more manufacturing going on. The building was constructed as a, fa as a factory, not a research facility, which was problematic. Uh, was one of the reasons why we eventually, you know, chose to move away. <coughs> These are some of the products you might have seen being manufactured. Uh, wooden wall telephones, candlestick telephones, and switchboards. So when you see these operators at these old uh, switching stations, the equipment that they're working is what was being manufactured here. 
at Western. And these are what we call private switchboards that you would have at a hotel or a business, PBX switching. And cable, telephone cable. So you could imagine trying to connect 70 million people, you've got to do it by copper cable. So we had facilities around the country making telephone cable. What are those women doing? They're actually inspecting the cables. They have to look at the ends of the cable and they have to inspect how it was constructed. They're, they're doing final quality control check. This is the timeline of innovations that I've come up with, and I think you would all gasp if I had to cover all of these. So, what I was talking about before is, I'm gonna to try to highlight the ones that were really focused and the research was done primarily out of this building, or that the direction for the research was directed out of this building. So I won't be hitting uh, in detail all of these, but I will touch on just about everything. Uh, you'll see vacuum tube research, the transistor, telephotography, sound motion pictures. It's really extensive. It's, it's been a lot of fun putting it together. I'll tell you. So the biggest, probably milestone, is when the vacuum tube was invented. And the inventor of the vacuum tube didn't come from Bell Laboratories. Uh, he actually was on the outside of the company, and he had a vacuum tube that was actually a poor performing vacuum tube. And when he brought it to Bell Laboratories, our experts immediately realized the potential of what the vacuum tube could do. And we realized that there was defects in his design. So we, we changed the material inside the tube and we increased the vacuum. We made it a high vacuum tube. It got rid of impurities. And this opened up a brand new world for communication. And many of the developments that came from West Street have their, uh, basically relied on vacuum tube technology. First thing after the vacuum tube was created, we could finally go as far as we wanted with a telephone wire. So by 1915, we were offering transcontinental telephone service. 1915, we, we connected all the way from New York to California, to San Francisco actually. Picture over there on the left, is the last telephone pole going up in the transcontinental line. So you think of the old golden spike in the railroad. This was our golden spike. Interesting tidbit, that pole is in our archives. It was, it was eventually taken down, and it was used for construction of somebody's house. And the kids in the towns, their, their, their teacher challenged them to find out why is their town historic. And it was because the line was connected there. And they figured out that this person had uh, floorboards and support from these telephone poles. They reached out and donated it back to our company. And when we looked at it, the first thing we said was, it does look right, it's the right shape, everything looks accurate. And the thing that gave it away was spike holes. Inside. There was a multitude of spikes from their boots with pointers on them. When they put this up, everybody got a chance to climb to the top of the pole and have champagne. So those, those spikes, all the holes were there. So that's one of the artifacts that we care for. Where was it? This was uh, Nevada, Utah. I actually forgot the name of the town, but it was right in the Utah area. I, I don't know the town off my hand. I'll my hand. The actual uh, opening of it, we had Alexander Graham Bell come out of retirement. And he talked to Thomas Watson, his assistant, across the country. And when Bell invented the phone, the famous words were, Mr. Watson, come here, I want you. And he spoke by accident, and he was heard by accident by the, by the receiver, by Watson. So he said the same words to Watson, and Watson's response from California was, uh, it would take me four days to get to you. <laughs> Which one is Theodore Bell? Theodore Bell is in the picture here. He missed the event a little bit. He was on Catalina Island off California. He was connected by phone. He hurt his leg and was recuperating on vacation off of California. Now I only know that because I read this caption last night. So, so far I'm challenged. Now we're talking about another big one. In 1915, in an experiment directed from here, but took place in Paris, at the top of the Eiffel Tower, and in Virginia, in the US, we transmitted voice by radio. People were doing telegraph transmissions, but successfully crossing the ocean with a radio signal and a voice signal and being heard had never been done before. And in 1915, that was done through research out of this facility, making amplifiers with vacuum tubes. And that led to the eventual opening of transatlantic telephone service. Now, between crossing the country and now crossing the ocean, they knew the telephone service could go anywhere in the world. The limitations were now 
Those hurdles were now solved. The next thing was really how to make the quality better, how to increase capacity of calls. So by 1927, commercial service opened up. And what we have here is a uh, sample of the opening at the event. <laughs> President of AT&T talking to London. This was the place where these innovations took place, the ideas for it, and the actual experiments leading to commercial service. The next one is high fidelity recording. So what I'm talking about is when Thomas Edison made a record player, you spoke into a tube and your voice sounds, your, the, the power of your voice vibrated a needle and etched a wax record. For decades, that was the way to make a recording. Bell Laboratories took the vacuum tube and made microphones and amplifiers, and they could pick up more sound with these sensitive microphones because the amplifiers were driven by vacuum tubes. That increased the amount of sounds you could pick up, and then we amplified the sound to replay it. So high fidelity recording and electrical recording developed right here at West Street. From this room come many of the newest ideas in sound recording. He is cutting the wax such as is used in white phone production and in the playback. Sue took father's shoe bench out. She was waiting at my lawn. Let's look into this. I need pea soup at 615. She <laughs> took father's shoe bench out. She was waiting at my lawn. I need pea soup at 615. Sue took father's shoe bench out. These engineers are perfectly sane, and the whole first register, so will any others in the dictionary. So that's an example of how they electrified the recording. You can see there's, there's no one screaming into cones. In the older days, if you wanted to make a recording, even in the orchestra, they're huddled around this cone to send the sound waves into the cone to get vibrated on a wax disc to make a record. So you can see how uh, basically inconvenient that is. And the quality was very poor. Bell Labs at West Street came up with the microphones. And that's a microphone on the stand right there. And now they could go where the, where the conductor wanted the orchestra to be. And they could be picked up. And it could be picked up with much more sound, uh, much more information coming into that microphone is being picked up. And this is, this is a revolution in recording. We have a Grammy from the recording industry for bringing about high fidelity and stereo recording techniques. So you see the difference there. These are the types of microphones that were designed here at West Street. So you might be familiar with some of these. You've seen them in old movies for years. This is a ribbon microphone, a carbon button microphone. The movie coil one in the upper left hand corner is for movies. And the condenser microphone. All these are high performance microphones, so much better due to the vacuum tube and because of the technology behind them. Also, which is also little known, is speaker design. Adding tweeters, woofers, and mid-ranges together started at Bell Laboratories. That huge speaker over there on the left uh, was for orchestra music at theaters. And then these smaller types could be set up for radios, for music, public address systems. Special types of discs that we designed to make these recordings, these are gold sputtered. There's actually gold on them because it picks up the sound better. The type of gold, that the material that the gold is made from. The softness of the gold enhanced the recording on these discs. There's a, they're holding the disc, they're pressing the discs in this photograph. And now, most importantly, once we started to show the results of high fidelity recording, we attracted the attention of the outsiders in the music industry. 
Leopold Stokowski in the 1930s came to Bell Laboratories, came to West Street. He met with our experts and he heard these recordings. And he was thrilled that his orchestra could finally be recorded and reproduced with so much better quality. And he would be thrilled to have this done. That he worked with Bell Laboratories and we started to work with him to demonstrate our technology, our sound recording and our sound reproduction. One of the events that we did, the sound was so good, we put an audience at the, the Philadelphia Theater, we had an audience looking at a stage with the curtains down, and we set up two of those giant speakers that I had on the other slide in front of that audience. They couldn't see the speakers. The orchestra was playing in the lobby into microphones. The audience thought they were in front of them and found out when they raised the curtains, they were listening to two speakers. They were getting stereo and they were getting high quality, high fidelity recording. So some of the first hi-fi recordings came from Bell Laboratories. We have some of these recordings in our archives. Uh, this is an example. So you, you, that call, that in the transatlantic call I just played, you saw how scratchy it was. That was like the quality of music when it was being played back then. Until this... Washington, D.C., people in D.C. listening to, to speakers like this, all brand new, to me just mind-blowing. Okay, another one was public address systems. So again, if you wanted to talk to a large audience before the public address system in the 1920s, you had a cone megaphone and you would just sit there and yell, and maybe the first 10 rows of people could hear you. This is 40,000 people at that factory in, in Chicago that I talked about. There are 10-foot speakers mounted up here in the inset. You can see those. They're 10-foot long speakers with huge magnetic drivers that are allowing all these people to hear the president of Western Electric address the audience. This has never even been done before. Again, about connecting the world with technologies out of West Street. Now, you could actually transmit a speech from a president through the telephone network into a public address system, and anybody could hear them live. So this really connected the world, not just with telephones, but with things like this, with public address systems. Here's a really cute thing I found. Up on the roof of West Street, they mounted one of our 10-foot horn speakers. I think if you did that today, you'd scare them. <laughs> but this was aimed out at the river, across the street, to an ocean liner that was going by. The, pre the president of Western Electric was going to Europe, and they're screaming to him, Bon voyage, best wishes. And he's sitting on the deck of this ship going, yeah, that's my company. <laughs> so this speaker we have in our archive collection, but it's, it's really, it's hard to display. It would fit here. Okay. Now we move into the world of wireless, wireless technology. So again, the vacuum tube allows us to do things with amplification. It also allows us to transmit radio signals better. So that's what makes wireless communications practical. So we're continuing to build out a copper network connecting the world, but we're already looking for ways to do things wirelessly. First, we start in 1913, ship to shore radio telephone service. Right off the coast of New York, Western, um, West, uh, West Street uh, researchers off of New York and New Jersey are transmitting uh, voice calls to ocean liners. We started with Navy ships. So you have a whole radio room, brand new kind of thing, on a ship where you had powerful transmitters transmitting uh, signals back to the coast. So you could do two-way radio telephone calls in 1913. By 1914, they asked us to start talking to airplanes. This was a brand new challenge. We had to take the equipment that went into those radio rooms and ocean liners and shrink it down to what would fit into these biplanes. These planes, having just been invented, really, airplanes, the pilot and co-pilot couldn't even talk to each other. They used hand signals. It was too noisy. The engine, the wind, the vibrations. We built special microphones here, and we built the earpieces inside the helmet. And with a radio set, radio set similar to these in the cockpit, 
The planes could now talk to the ground. The planes could talk to other planes if they switched channel. And they could talk to the co-pilot by switching a channel. This was the first mass-produced, air-to-ground, voice communication system ever made, designed here, designed here at West Street. So you have ship to shore, air to ground, then we move into cars. And the first place we went for was the police and emergency vehicles. So we were doing in the beginning, in the 1920s, one-way transmission. The problem was cars move through buildings and hills. Ships and planes, there's not much to interfere with the radio signal, but once you become in an environment that the cars are traveling in, it was a bigger challenge. So we used to have to drive around through New York and do the can you hear me now test. And the first thing we did was, well, we can transmit out pretty easy. So we loaded the cars with receivers, but they couldn't talk back. And it took until the 40s that we could do uh, that kind of service. So but here's an advertisement where we can say now one radio patrol call and a patrol car with radio is as good as eight patrolmen on foot. And then by 1946, we roll out two-way car phone service. 1946, in New York City, there were millions of people already. People did like the telephone. But in New York City, only 24 people at once could make a mobile phone call. <laughs> so we solved the problem, but now we had to increase capacity. So it was pretty frustrating. By the 60s, we had increased that number, but it was still a problem. The cellular concept, which I'll explain later, was really what came out to solve that problem. That was by the 70s. <coughs> One of the very first radio stations, WEAF, was started with Bell Labs and at t It was called WEAF. The transmitting room that you see right here was in West Street. It was right here. This was a studio that was the at t building, and these were the types of antennas. We had something like this at the roof of West Street. This wasn't the exact antenna. So what's the first? Well, it was one of the first radio stations, and what I say here was eventually sold to NBC. Um, and it has the dubious distinction of being one of the first radio stations with commercials. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Bell Labs Innovation. Uh, the next one I want to talk about is uh, the negative feedback amplifier. This one's a little more technical, but really I had to address it. Uh, let me start the video on this. In 1921, Harold Black began working on an efficient distortion-free amplifier that would permit long-distance transmission of large numbers of telephone calls at low cost. I tried again and again to build practical or viable amplifiers that would accomplish what I was trying to do. And then came the fateful morning in August of 1927. I got a ferry and went to work just like any other day. I was looking at the statue of Lebanon, and all of a sudden, the idea came to me in a flash. I thought, of how to make the negative feedback amplify. Then, I bought a New York ton. I had nothing to write on, so I bought it. And I opened the page, and it was a mere accident that that particular day, I had the name of the newspaper and the date, and then the entire page was almost a very clean page. And I by no means felt. I spent a little time making the diagram. I call it a canonical diagram because it is universal and applies to any electrical, mechanical, chemical, hydrodynamical, any 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 wave system that you can think of. The negative feedback amplifier works this way. At the input is the low level signal you want to amplify. At the output is the amplified signal, magnified in the way you want. But the amplifier introduces distortion, which is also magnified. 
By connecting a small portion of the output back to the input, the distortion is cancelled and the signal becomes clear. Okay, so why am I bringing this up? First of all, it's really cool he was taking the ferry to West Street and he comes up with this idea looking at the statue. Of <laughs> the second thing that I thought was really cool is that he put it on the New York Times. We usually have laboratory notebooks, they're numbered, and when someone comes up with an idea, they have to uh, get it witnessed by someone else. So he's scribbling and had it actually witnessed. This, this newspaper is in our archives. And uh, what he did was he cleaned up amplified sound. And anybody here that works with acoustics and understands amplification, every 50 miles you had to start to amplify a voice call. If you have to cross the country, you realize they were amplifying your voice plus the static. And it got worse and worse and worse. Here's a guy who figured out feeding it back into, each, into itself somehow cancels out the static and keeps the voice clear. That is still used today. Negative feedback is, for one time, positive because it was a great idea. So I had to cover that one. Okay, now we move into telephotography, or what we would know as fax technology. This is a picture from the Western uh, West, uh, Bell Labs design system for sending an image back in 1924. This is Babe Ruth after he hit a home run. It's a photograph that was created from a fax negative that was created out of our equipment. It has a hundred lines of resolution, so it looked very clear. This catches the attention of the newspaper industry because they have printing presses around the country, but they were never able to send the same photograph and have it printed out at all their newspaper printing places. So they would lease our equipment. This is the fax equipment, so it's not something small. It's a room of equipment. That's the transmitting equipment on the top and the receiving equipment at the, at the bottom. It took eight minutes to send one photograph, 1924. But now you're using a network of copper that you went to all this expense to lay across the country for more than just voice. Now you're sending photographs. So we're building towards more capabilities from the network, more innovations, uh, more uses for that. Now we move into sound motion pictures. This is something a lot of people know came out of uh, Bell Laboratories and out of West Street. Uh, there was a sound picture laboratory here. They started to look at um, using the high fidelity recording and reproduction techniques to study and improve the voice network, the telephone voice network. So one of the things we needed to do in studying that is coordinate sound with film. Things that we were recording, we wanted it to be synchronized. So we ended up devising a system that had been done before, a record with film, but it was the quality of the sound, because of our high fidelity recording techniques, that this was very popular. So one of the first companies to be interested in looking at this was Warner Brothers. Back in the 20s, Warner Brothers owned the movie theaters. They weren't allowed to later on, but in the 20s, they, were, they owned those theaters. If someone was going to invest from going to silent to motion pictures with sound, it was going to have to take a pretty good invention to convince them to do that to all their theaters. Introduction of the microphone has been received both by the public and the artistic world with a great deal of interest and favor. And it seems altogether fitting that this year, which marks the semi centennial of the birth of the telephone should also mark the introduction in perfected form of a new application of the telephonic principle, a development which is destined to create an entirely new art. <laughs> Through your eyes and ears, a demonstration of the principles and manner of operation of a complicated mechanism. So these photos are showing you the opening of movies. Don Juan, one of the first movies with a synchronized soundtrack with it. So you have the marquee here, and you have the Vitaphone technology talked about here. The code, the the product name was Vitaphone. So this is actually a clip of uh, some of the new movies that came out. Just a few years later, Sin 
but is sound and motion pictures by Vitaphone, a Western Electric and Warner Brothers Enterprise, rock the entertainment world. So this is what the equipment looked like. You had a, a projector that you could actually take your silent film projector and adapt it to our equipment, and you had a record here that was synchronized with it. These were called Vitaphone projectors. They were very rare because in three years, we figured out how to put the soundtrack right on the film strip. So these became outdated, so they're hard to get. Steven Spielberg, is, I was told by collectors, has one of these in his living room. And I just want to say, Bell Labs has five of them. <laughs> And then, of course, we're bragging that we have uh, 10 Oscars 10 years in a row. So, so I just want to make clear, we've got a Grammy, we've got Oscars, and later on we did get an Emmy. Uh, the next one I'm going to talk about briefly is the wave nature of matter. And the reason I'm bringing it up is because the researcher that did it got a Nobel Prize. He basically was working with improving vacuum tubes, and he was uh, trying to get better amplification out of them. And he was bouncing electrons off of crystals that would go inside tubes like this. And when working with a piece of nickel crystal, he bounced electrons and saw the patterns that were reflected and ended up on a sheet. And he realized that the patterns weren't in direct lines. They were, moved, they were actually in waves. And there was a theory about the wave nature of matter that hadn't been proven. And in his experiment using this electron diffraction tube here, uh, he actually proved the wave nature of matter. What that led in uh, electronics was a better understanding of semiconductors and the physics and the surface of electronic electrical materials. This eventually led to our invention of the transistor and other Nobel Prize winning discoveries. This is our first of eight Nobel Prizes at Bell Laboratories, and his lab was here. He got uh, the Nobel Prize in, 1920, in 1937. He did his experiments 10 years earlier. Now we move to another big one, television. I talked about telephotography in 1924. Eight minutes to send a single image. Somebody got the great idea about sending a moving image. Bell Labs does not claim to have invented the first TV. We did build our own TV system. What we said was, we're going to make a very fast fax machine. And that's what we did. On April 7, 1927, the telephone was 51 years old. In a New York auditorium, a handful of people were given a glimpse of the future. It was called television. The show, if you can call it that, originated in Washington, D.C. and starred Herbert Hoover, then Secretary of Commerce. This first crew transmission was the work of engineers from Bell Laboratories. They had invented the transmission system not for the sake of entertainment, but to learn more about long-distance networks. At the time, few people realized just how successful the experiment would turn out to be. 1927. He's up on a stage. And George, I think it's the 12th floor where the auditorium was? The 11th. 11th floor, sorry. 11th floor. That's Herbert Ives, the lead researcher. He's holding what was called a light valve. It was a, uh, a, a vacuum tube that had selenium in it. Selenium is a material that reacts to sunlight or light, it kind of shakes the electrons, and there's an electrical impulse that comes out. The brilliant people at Bell Laboratories figured out how to expose it to light, take that impulse, code it into an image, transmit it through the telephone network 200 miles, and do the first long-distance television transmission ever 
with Herbert Hoover in Washington, D.C. before he was the president, he was Department of Commerce. The AT&T president is here at West Street on the 11th floor looking at Herbert Hoover's face. And Hoover's over here looking into the camera. When you download a video to your cell phone today, think that this was the very first time a video was sent through the telecommunications network. As they said in the video, we weren't interested in making TVs. The telephone network became the carrying medium for television shows in the 40s and the 50s when the network was first created. They trans transmitted images through the telephone network and by that time it was microwave. So we accomplished what we wanted to do, again using the network for more than just voice. Now, not just still images, now we're also talking about video. <coughs> This is the back of that television screen. You can see how complicated it is. Okay, thousands of wires. This set is on display at Murray Hill at our Bell Labs. We'll talk about that later. Uh, there was one large neon tube that these wires penetrated, believe it or not. So I tell the kids when they come visit this TV, I said it was the first big screen TV. <laughs> so she's standing in front of a scanner, and her image is being transmitted. This is when we moved in 1929. She's doing a color experiment. So she's got flowers on her outfit. And of course, you can't keep the researchers off the roof. So here they are on West Street, doing the first outdoor television. The early days of TV needed a lot of light. It was almost blinding. By this time, was it 1928? We're already using natural sunlight and picking up TV images. Now we'll talk about, very quickly, Technology goes beyond telecommunications, right? This is now amplifying sound and recording techniques lead to electronics that can help the hearing and the people who can speak. Oops. The course of our research work here, designing and improving telephone apparatus, We've developed a wonderful little instrument called an artificial bearing, which takes the place of those lost vocal cords. The lower end of this tube is seen to be up in the rock. You hold the metal lattice in your hand, something like a pipe. We remove by bridge, which is two thousand curves and levels of the love, all the sound vibrations in the world. Exactly. Artificial larynx for people who lose their larynx. We have a history of continuing with that to electrical, electrical artificial larynx that we sold at cost. Also, early hearing aids. So we have a, uh, one of the first hearing aids, which was a little less than portable, 1923. <laughs> so the, the hearing aid got a lot smaller in a few years. It's there on the left. With miniature vacuum tubes before the transistor was invented. So we're pretty proud of that because, again, it's an invention that went beyond telecommunication. The first quartz clock made with quartz crystal as an oscillator was done here at Bell Laboratories. William Marison did it. This was 1927. And I'd like to say that that's what the first one looked like, but actually it looked like this. <laughs> the display model that he had there, he traveled around with huge crystal on top. It's, here, it's at our Bell Laboratories building part of the archive collection. So when you talk about quartz crystal or quartz watches, this was Bell Labs. So you, you don't know how many things from Bell Labs you're actually carrying around with. Yes? Is all that stuff around the clock part of the clock? Yeah, they're here to, they're here to drive the clock. Um, this, this glass piece here has the quartz in it, and then some of these mechanisms are part of the clock, and then the actual face of the clock. Down below, I'm, I guess some of the batteries are driving it. I'm not sure about all these tubes, i got to be honest with you. Okay, the birth of a science, radio astronomy. We have a researcher named Carl Jansky, and he's charged with cleaning up static for radio telephone calls across the ocean. So again, we solved the problem of distance, but now we have to improve the quality.
Humphreys, a group of Bell Labs engineers in central New Jersey were working on transatlantic radio telephone circuits. They were trying to understand the noise or static in them. Bell Labs asked one of the Chum staff members, Carl Jansky, to locate the noise. Jansky studied the problem. Then he built a directional antenna, a rather strange looking array of lumber and hardware. He mounted it on four rubber tires. No, we're going to skip it. We'll just go to it. What he did was he built an antenna in New Jersey, and it rotated during the day, all year long, and he would pick up sources of static. And he started to figure out solar flares, solar flares cause static, electrical storms, even cities create static. One bit of static that came in on a regular basis at the same time, almost every day, it just changed a little bit. He finally identified it as coming in with the timing of the moving of the, of the constellations. And he identified the radio waves coming from outer space. 1933, outer space. So he wrote it up, and he announced it to the world, and no one paid attention. What he really built was the first radio telescope. And he is credited with starting radio astronomy with this discovery. It took 15 more years before scientists started using it as a tool. It was a guy named Reber that built a telescope out of that. He died before he got a Nobel Prize. He had to be alive, which I think he still do. So he wasn't recognized with a Nobel Prize. A replica of his first antenna is at a famous uh, observatory in Green Bank, uh, West Virginia. And they measure the signal strength coming in in Jansky's, in honor of Carl Jansky. So now we've started a brand new science. <laughs> Coaxial cable. So everybody knows about cable TV. Each of the four coaxials consists of a tube as an outer conductor with a copper inner conductor down the middle. Oh, those are our videos. Coaxial simply means that the tube and its inner conductor have the same. We'll skip it. We'll go right to the pictures. So the coaxial cable for cable TV companies invented and patented here at West Street. An early cable like this one in the upper left-hand corner could replace regular copper cables. 90 of these cables, the equivalent of that one cable. So again, we needed to increase capacity of the telephone network, so we stretched these coaxial cables to do long-distance calls and carry tons and tons. Over 108,000 two-way conversations through that coaxial cable. So cable TV companies owe their innovations to us. Now we're talking about the first electrical digital computer. We had a mathematician, his name was uh, George Stibbitz, and he built this crude little device at a telephone relays from switching equipment, electromechanical switching equipment, and batteries and flashlight uh, uh, bulbs and he built the first binary adder, electrical binary adder. This could do simple calculations like one or two, adding one and adding two to one. He realized that a larger version of this could do very complex number calculations. So he built what they called originally the complex number calculator. That's what's shown here on the bottom. This was here at Western. It's considered the first electrical digital computer. I'm not trying to impress anybody with that. Computers improved over so many years. What I really love about this story is, not only did we use this to solve networking and design problems, but it was accessed by a teletype, which meant he could be out of state using a teletype through the telephone network to send information and a problem to a computer. The computer solved the problem, and it was transmitted back to his teletype. He's remotely accessing a computer in 1939. So what we take advantage of again today, every time you access some company server or you know, anybody through the internet, 1939 was when this was done. This wasn't the first use of data going through wires, through telephone wires, but this is the first time it's computer data going through that network. So again, voice, still image, television, now computer data. Yeah? Is this tier able to use tele a teletype as well? Multiple yes, there was actually multiple access. That's another thing I didn't make a note of. You're absolutely right. Now we have voice synthesis. This was a fun one. You're looking at a photograph from the World's Fair in New York. This was... Okay, someone's going to come over and help me. 
19, I'm, I'm, I'm just thrilled. Bell System Pavilion in New York, we demonstrated a machine that could replicate human voice. So we're synthesizing the voice. I have people today still interested in how we did this who are in the companies that make synthesizers for music. This is the very beginning of that technology. Our expertise in, in uh, sound. Where did this mask go? There. I hope the sound works better than the videos. There are 10 filter circuits in the motor, and combined with the two energy sources, they give a total of 20 separate components to be used in building up speech sounds. But now let's have Mr. Garrett and Ms. Harper actually show us what the motor can do with these 20 separate sounds. Well, we've heard the motor make a word, and by combining words, of course, we get a sentence. For example, Helen, would you have the motor say, she saw me? It's not an awfully flat. How about a little expression? Say the sentence in answer to these questions. Who saw you? Who did she say? Well, did she see you or hear you? Now, so far, you have only heard the voter speak in one voice. But the voter has other voices which he can use when Ms. Harper makes a simple adjustment in his mechanism. Ellen, will you have the voter say, Greetings, everybody? Greetings, everybody. Now, will you have him repeat that in a high voice? <laughs> so, why is it important? It's cool, but it's important because we figured out how to code speech. And if a machine can replicate it, then the machine can transmit it. Instead of sending just an analog wave of a voice, which is how we go through a microphone, now we're starting to look at how to code it, compress it, only send what the sounds we want to hear. For it. It's the beginning of where we are today, where we send packets of sound and data in chunks rather than in these old-fashioned waves. And it also starts an industry for, for voice synthesizers and music synthesizers. Uh, radar was another development here uh, in the 1930s. I'm not going to try to run the video. So off the coast, uh, that was the uh, upper corner is uh, New Jersey. Uh, we were doing experiments first with radio altimeters for airplanes. And then we adapted it towards radar. So those things were first developed in the United States here, and then we partnered with the UK to perfect the system and use them during World War II. Is it considered a British invention? Or it's considered a British invention, but I have to say that the more we do digging, Bell Labs doesn't get the credit in the history books yet. <laughs> Information theory. It's another one that's kind of technical, but I have to touch on it. Claude Shannon was a mathematician like Stibitz with that early computer. He figured out how to measure information going through a network. So again, I talk about the primitive days, you would drive around and say, can you hear me now? Or you would pick up the connection of the phone and find out whether it worked or not when you were building this equipment and designing it. Uh, Claude Shannon figured out how to predict the capacity of networks, how to measure information going through those networks, how to figure out how much failure you're going to get in a message going through those networks. You feed this data into his algorithms and you get the results. You can start to design networks without having to build it first and seeing if it works. Information theory is more used today than it was in his day. And when you talk about bits, bytes, and megabytes, this is the guy that started it. This is the guy that started with bits. He was measuring things in bits and he told the world how to do that and it has applications in statistics and all other things in different industries. He's still honored. There's a bust of two people in our, <coughs> at our headquarters. <coughs> Alexander Graham Bell and Claude Shannon. And next year we mark his 100th, end of, uh, his 100th birthday, so we're having Claude Shannon day out at our <laughs> Okay, so here's the bad news. We need more space. West Street is crowded. New York City is noisy. There's vibrations. The building was a factory, not a laboratory. So in 1939, we looked to New Jersey. We break ground for the Murray Hill facility. And when I say we needed space, we're talking 250 acres. Okay, we got out there, not too far, right? Less than an hour. These were our neighbors. So uh, actually, I think one of those houses still exists. Uh, 1939, in 1941, we built building one. 
Uh, what's next to it over there is an auditorium, and uh, there's a soundproof chamber that we built inside of there. For years, it was known as the world's quietest room. The uh, sound cones, if anybody deals in music, were five feet deep, still there. It's considered my largest artifact. Uh, and we started to move people out to this area. We had other satellite locations, but this one was really designed for research from the beginning. The walls are modular. We had physics going on, we had chemical laboratories, we had everything behind hallway walls now. It was ideally suited. Even the outside property was designed to look like a Princeton campus to get people to think like they're at a university. Eventually, by the 1980s, Murray Hill was built to this. Um, some of these sections have been taken down now, but uh, by the 80s, we had four or five major buildings. Facilities in Homedale, New Jersey, out at, uh, in, near Chicago. Um, so this was the beginning where the researchers were moving out of West Street and doing more work in New Jersey. So the things that I just talked about were really concentrated here at West Street. After that, when Murray Hill starts, we get into some more innovations. Now the transistor, I don't have to tell you, brought transistor radios, microelectronics, revolutionizes the electronics industry, gains a Nobel Prize. The researchers were at Murray Hill, but a lot of the technologies behind the semiconductors, going back to that Nobel Prize about uh, wave nature of matter, started here. And this was Bell Labs headquarters, West Street. So the research was still being somewhat directed out at Murray Hill from West Street. So this is a Nobel Prize. The cellular concept actually thought up in 1947. And this is how we figured out how to have more people be able to use mobile phones and cars. Instead of transmitting the signal across the whole city, somebody said, shoot it out a few blocks. Someone else on the other side of town could use that same radio channel. That's the cellular concept. They thought for radio propagation, a cellular shape is the best way to, to lay out your antennas. And it took until the 70s to put it into practice. Solar cell was invented at Bell Laboratories. Solar energy. On our property, we have a solar farm. It does about 6% of the energy requirements for our building. We were the first ones to put these out on telephone poles. We were bringing telephone service with this bit of electricity to people who had no electricity at all and no telephone. Later on, it was adapted for use in satellites. And of course, today, they're basically everywhere. Undersea telephone cables. So we had under, we had radio telephone service in 27. In 1956, we finally could do a cable across the ocean that would work. It needed 50 repeaters, and those repeaters couldn't fail because you didn't want to go out in the middle of the ocean and try to fix it. So we had coaxial cables, two, one for each direction of the call, and we successfully did this in 1956. When they had the original underwater cable that was used for telegraph. Did it have repeaters as well? There were amplifiers in the telegram. No, the telegram. But there weren't as many? I don't know how many were because it wasn't our cable, so I, I don't know. They, they said that was a problem they knew it, and that's why? Or? Uh, but for this, it was, it's much harder and intricate to, to amplify a voice signal than it is just an electrical impulse. And so, so much simpler that it was 1865, the first attempt at a telegraph cable. 1956. The phone was invented in 1876. I mean, we had radio telephone service, so we were we could at least talk. The laser, we were co credited with co-inventing. One of the very first communication satellite, Telstar 1, 1962. Transistors inside, powered by solar cells, microwave amplifiers, all developed at Bell Laboratories. Touch tone phones, 1963. Ten button touch phone, right? No pounder asterisk case, right? They didn't do anything at that time. So, there's a lot for Bell Laboratories, and the best things in you know, early days really led us up to what we're doing research today. Wireless communications, photonics with lasers, uh, sending information, handling transmission of videos. These are all things that Bell Labs is, is doing now to help the telecommunications providers, the big companies like at and Verizon, do what they do and bring out the services to you. There's the auditorium that I never saw. George. <laughs> Here's some pictures. I'm not an expert on the construction, and I do not, cannot re verify these dates. But you can see the Western Electric Factory on the left, the two buildings there. So it was originally started as factories. And then the, the other section here, uh, all those wood pilings, right? Originally they say this property was underwater. 
and that they had to actually put pilings into the ground to support the building we're standing in right now. 1900, the building looked like this. 1910, President Taft crossed the street making a speech. Making a speech without a public address system, by the way. <laughs> Hadn't been invented yet, if he only went across the street. Uh, 1925 construction, so that looks like the rear, what I would call the rear of the property. 1923, somebody's getting a ticket from a cop. <laughs> I love the street, right? It's cobblestone. I don't know that that's still there. I don't know if you all know whether that's true or not. Uh, 1930, 1933, where is this street? Miller Highway. Is it gone? Yeah. Did you guys save a piece of it for me? <laughs> John and I were standing out front of the building going, where is it? 1934, the famous train coming through. 1940, employees. Uh, 1960, 1966, aerial view from 66, and my last photo in our collection is 1970, showing the balcony, right? So these were additions, so I think that's pretty cool. I have a handout for anybody interested. It has this information on it. It's my contact information. I'm recommending if you want to know more about the history of Bell Labs, you can get uh, George, John Gertner's book. Uh, there's an exhibition right now, it's opening tomorrow, Silicon City, New York Historical Society. Many of the Bell Labs inventions from here are there with other inventions. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about the, the inventors that you're talking about. Yes. All, everything they invented belonged to Bell Laboratories, right? Not only that, everything they invented belonged to the United States. Bell Laboratories was under a monopoly of AT&T. We were obligated to share the technology. Unless it had some kind of military secrecy, we had to license it out to the world. I have a patent, I'm sorry, I have a license agreement with Sony. When they came here, before they were called Sony, in 1952, to get the license on how to make and use transistors to make radios. So for $15,000, Sony got that from us. They came, we have, we have technology transfers between major companies like that, where we share licenses. So usually, you know, we want their stuff, they want ours. You have a nice, happy negotiations, and then they all go to dinner. They called me up one day, and they said, it's 1990s, they said, we have to give the, um, the uh, chairman a gift. We usually have a ceremonial gift after the negotiations are over, and they're million dollar negotiations. So I said, well, you know, Sony came to us, why don't I give you a copy of the license agreement? I don't have to check, but we have a license agreement for $15,000, and a picture of the first transistor. It turned out, the person who signed that license agreement became the chairman of Sony with his own signature. Oh. <laughs> so that, yes, we had to share our, our inventions. Uh, researchers even today sign an agreement, if I invent something I have, I, I can't own it if I'm working for the company, you get a, an award, a cash award for coming up with patents, it's nowhere near what they might be worth. And there's technologies that we're working on today that are significant. But there are all these great scientists who wanted to work for the no Scientists or artists? in my mind. They don't care about money as much as normal people. <laughs> really, they love science. They still do today. So they had good support from the company for doing their work, is what you're saying. You, you could write a book, like John Gertner, and try to capture how Bell Labs came up with all these inventions. And there's a million reasons. There's money, there's support, there's genius, there's good management. It's, it's, it's having people together. There's all types of reasons. I haven't found anybody to really put it into a paragraph. I, I want them to keep trying. I want more books. Beth. Given the divestment and the change and the development then of the Lucent and Bell Corps and also the Bell Labs continuing, was there a relative decline in basic science and more applied science? I'm not going to go on and talk about that because I don't have what you might think of as basic science versus what we're even doing today will be arguable. So you can listen to a lot of different people, but there were people who swore we weren't going to get Nobel Prizes after AT&T broke up. And we have our last Nobel Prize in 1914 for something that was done in the 1990s. I'm working with some smart people that are doing things that you might look at. I don't know how you might, what bucket you would put that into, but I think they're Nobel Prize worthy. So whether it's in core research, physics research, or whatever you want to call it, it's good research. And I, and I really don't want to be a representative of Bell Labs. I can't no, talk about Western. The point is that the management of it is not saying, gee, we're going to see a financial return. It's still really doing fundamental science. Science at Bell Laboratories is driven by an initial problem. 
So we do look at problems, either predicting the future or whatever. There's something that starts it. After that, it's different in every research group. So this handout is out there, uh, exhibition in Silicon City. Now uh, let's hold our questions for a couple more slides. I want Ed to finish talking, uh, and then we'll bring the house lights up for questions. The Bell Labs exhibit that I talked about is at Murray Hill. That original TV, a Vitaphone projector, a Crowley laser, a Telstar, a real Telstar, the first transistor. These are on display at Murray Hill. And then, of course, for folks who want to know about Bell Labs today, we have our, our web page at, at Bell Labs. And my last little story is about this guy. This was in uh, 2005 at uh, my archives office. The antenna behind me was used in a 1923 experiment to transmit radio telephone from the United States to Europe before 1927 commercial service. I was restoring it. It's a piece of art to me. It's going outside the Bell Labs president's office, actually. That's where it was being planned to go. And I get a knock on our office door, and it's George Eberhardt. He's 101 years old. <laughs> He's got this weird stick, he calls it a listening stick, and he wants to donate it to the archives, to Bell Labs. And so I bring him in, he's got his wife with him, and I bring him into my conference room where this antenna was, and he looks at the antenna and he says, I know this antenna, I worked on it. When he was 20 years old, he was here. He got hired as a messenger boy, but he was a, he was a radio freak. He was starting to play with those vacuum tubes, and his father said, you need to work at Bell Labs. And his father was dead on. So he ended up working for Bell Laboratories, working with radio transmission across the ocean, and then radar later in the 1940s. And here it is, he walks into my place and sees an antenna that was right here at West Street that he played with. He was outside the door looking into the auditorium when they did the TV demonstrations with Herbert Ives. He got to see that. This guy, all these old photos that I always play with, he's seen, he's seen the legends alive in person. So, now we can bring the lights up.